Well, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton caused a bit of a stir this week, likening Mexico's drug violence to an insurgency. What's next? A Mexican version of the U.S.'s controversial Plan Colombia? With 28,000 drug-related deaths since Mexican President Felipe Calderón came to power in 06, announcing a clampdown on trafficking, the picture is looking increasingly grim. But that's not all that's churning south of the border. While things heat up in Mexico, Brazilian election officials are clamping down on corruption and comedians in the run-up to next month's vote. And 33 Chilean miners have been trapped below ground for over a month. And that's probably where they'll be this September 11th. It's a memorable day in Chile, too, the anniversary of a U.S.-backed coup that overthrew a democratically elected, elected leader who promised workers a better deal. Is there any lesson here? Our Latin American correspondent, Greg Grandin, joins me next. These uh, drug uh, cartels are now showing more and more indices of insurgency. You know, all of a sudden car bombs show up, which weren't there before. So it's becoming, it's looking more and more like Colombia looked 20 years ago, where the narco traffickers control you know, certain parts of the country. The newly inaugurated uh, president of uh, Costa Rica, President Chinchilla, you know, said, we need help and we need a much more vigorous U.S. Uh, presence. So we are working to try to enhance what we have in Central America. Greg Grandin, thanks for coming back to Crit TV. Hillary Clinton speaking there, Secretary of State in front of the Council on Foreign Relations. Is it significant that she makes this insurgency claim? Well, I think it just speaks to the withering down of U.S. diplomacy and to just everything in terms of insurgency and counterinsurgency, mm -hmm. the failure of economic policy, the failure of diplomacy, the failure of coming up with a viable alternative to just decades and decades of failed policy towards Latin America. It's kind of like counterinsurgency as a way of life, just thinking about, you know, just thinking about Mexico as an insurgency. It is interesting. In some ways, there is a parallel, obviously, with Afghanistan and Iraq, is this U.S.'s inability to understand its own history mm. and how its own interventions, in, in Mexico in particular, economic intervention, has contributed to the crisis. But there is a crisis. I mean, I think it's, what, three mayors, the third mayor, and just under a month killed in Mexico, 73 migrant workers uh, yeah. captured the other day. I mean, you can't poo-poo what's going on. No, it's a crisis in every, you know, it's a, it's a human crisis in terms of just people's ability to live and, and have a dignified life. Um, it's both the immediate conjuncture, as uh, most recently, is, was Felipe Calderon's 2006 declaration of war on the cartels, which the U.S. fully endorsed. Mm. Part of that was a way of establishing legitimacy after he came to power in an illegitimate election, and the U.S. backing it. The larger context, of course, is, the, is two things. One is the is NAFTA, which has created enormous dislocation, weakened the state while at the same time creating these vacuums of authority that the drug cartels filled, uh, created massive dislocation in the countryside. People have, have you know, there's very few alternatives, migration, pouring into the city, or going to work for the cartels. The second logic context is the, is the war in, which she mentioned, which Hillary Clinton mentioned, is the war in Colombia. Plan Colombia had the effect of not doing anything to bring down the production of cocaine, but it did disrupt the, the transportation cartels in Colombia. And what the effect was that it telegraphed the violence up through Central America and into Mexico and in step the Mexican cartels. The, the, there are uh, car bombings in Colombia, too. There were yeah. some this summer, this month. Yeah, yeah. She didn't uh, mention those. No, she didn't mention those because Colombia is, of course, held up as a as a success story, even though it is one of the most violent places, particularly for political activists. Well, let's Earth. talk quickly about Brazil. There's an election coming up, probably not going to produce enormous change, but kind of interesting. As I looked at the coverage, they've revived an old law that bans satire and caricaturing politicians. How come? Well, in, again, in, in to step back in the logic context of this, this is Latin America's attempt to get some control over the media, of a monopolized, corporatized media that has very little to do with free speech um, and just trying to and just try to uh, um, you know impose a little bit of regulation on what is what is not what is not necessarily free speech if it's coming from from these corporatized media conglomerates yeah. finally Chile um, I remember this country of course is focused on September 11th the attacks there on 
in the U.S. But I remember going back all those nine years, I think I was set to interview that day Isabel Allende, yeah. who had a new book out uh, talking about her history, which goes back to the U.S.-backed coup against Salvador Allende. As these 33 miners prepare to mark that anniversary underground, trapped in that mine that we've been hearing about sporadically in the U.S., um, what are Chileans saying about their history, their... Well, you know, Ariel Dorfman, the great Chilean writer and playwright, uh, had, had, a, had a wonderful essay right after September 11, I think was published in The Guardian, where he thought that September 11, 2001 would have been an opportunity for the United States to rejoin the world, or to join the world for the first time, to understand its vulnerability and engage in a degree of solidarity. And of course, the U.S. responded with vindictiveness and self-righteousness. Um, there is a direct connection because a lot of the, the liberalization and deregulation of the mining industry uh, was made possible, can be traced back directly to that coup, which uh, we, many of the um, audience of, of this show will know that history, the, the neoliberalization that was instituted. In fact, Chile's current president, Sebastián Piñera, his brother, José Piñera, was instrumental uh, in, the, in, 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 in putting into place the legislation which led to this uh, liberalization and deregulation um, that, 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 that led to the emergence of these unregulated mines. There's 4,500 mines or something like that in Chile, and there's 18 mining uh, uh, regulators, you know, inspectors to inspect for safety. That even puts the United States to shame. Mm -hmm. Is there a contrast between the way that Pineda, for all of his family relations, is responding to this crisis in the way that we in the U.S. so far responded to, for example, the Massey disaster, the worst in U.S. history in years? Well, I think, I think um, Pineda has been, uh, I think he's trying to institute what could be understood as a kind of shock doctrine with a human face. He, um, he's using the disaster to push through a quite conservative uh, increase in tariffs and taxes on, on mining exports. The left and unions have been demanding much higher and much aggressive regulation and, much, and, and regulatory regime. In fact, the Congress voted down uh, just a few months ago a very conservative proposal that Pineda put forward. But it seems like he's going to use this in the name of reconciliation, in the name of taking action. So he's using the language of state intervention and regulation, not unlike in some ways what we see with the Democrats and, 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 and the Congress and Washington, where, they, where the Democrats in power talk about having a strong state regulatory system. But when you actually unpeel peel back what they're doing, it's actually not that much different from what the Republicans and what Bush did. And, and Pineda, in some ways, is, is, is much more effective at pushing forward this this, um, using this, this, using this crisis, this tragedy, this ongoing tragedy, to uh, use the use the ideal of reconciliation to put forward this proposal that he wants, which is basically what the mine, mining industry has wanted all along. Very quickly on the question of reconciliation, we've only got about thirty seconds, but we're going to be talking about rising vitriol in this country all these years after nine eleven. Um, the U.S. attacked so many Central and South American countries, <laughs> going back to Chile. Was there, did you ever see in those countries the kind of hate backlash that we've seen here? No, I have a Chilean friend that woke up on September 11, 2001, and, as, and before it was unclear who, who was responsible, said, fuera de los chilenos. It was, it was, the, Chile, it was the Chileans. But um, no, no, there's not that. There's, there's this, you know, there's, there's always, there's always a, a very clear distinction between the, what the government does and what the and what the people, which, which may actually be a degree of generosity that, that, uh, that isn't warranted. Oh, well, thanks so much for joining us again, Greg. We look forward to having you back very soon. We'll link to your books, Fordlandia, and more at our website. That's grittv.org. For more on the debate over the drug war and the border wars, you might be interested in a forum taking place in Marfa, Texas. The weekend of the 17th of this month, I'll be down there interviewing Charles Bowden and joined by people like Mark Danner and Dar Jamail. The Border Wars, uh, Marfa Dialogue, brought to you by the Nation Institute. There's more information at our website.